again, good morning and uh, in, in Cairo or Abu Dhabi and good afternoon uh, in Tokyo. I'm Satoshi Ikeuchi, a professor of religion and global security of RCAST Research Center for Advanced Science and Technology of the University of Tokyo. Um, I'm also uh, the head of the ROADS, which is um, RCAST Open Laboratory for Emergence Strategies, uh, which is um, established in, during uh, the, the past um, years. Um, the ROADS jointly with the IGSDA Institute for Global Security and Defense Affairs, uh, headed by Dr. Uh, Major General Said Ronin. Um, we jointly um, organized today's seminar on frontiers of security uh, the present day Egypt is faced with a generational transformation of media, cyber attacks, and public health crisis. Uh, thank you for joining us again. Um, this seminar is part of the series a webinar series entitled Geopolitical Dynamism in the Wider Middle East Region, which is jointly organized by Rhodes and IGSDA with the great help and support and inspiration uh, from the Dr. Said Ronin. Um, we have already done three seminars, and this is the four and uh, fourth, fourth seminar and um, hopefully we would continue on this under this framework, but uh, for the moment, this is the last seminar of this four, you know, quartet series of seminars. Uh, in the previous three seminars, we have been talking about mainly the emerging forces in the Middle East and surrounding area. Uh, and uh, also we were uh, focusing, we tended to focus on newly emerging regional powers like um, Turkey or like Israel, uh, Israel. But uh, one, one of the remaining topic, important topic is Egypt. Why is Egypt? Where Egypt is going, uh, going to? As an old regional power, uh, Egypt uh, usually have a very important role to play in the regional and international politics, but its presence has been uh, um, a little bit eclipsed by other emerging forces in the uh, Middle East, or particularly in the Gulf region, or particularly from non-Arab regional powers. But this seminar tackles with this topic where Egypt is going on right now. So uh, in grappling with this topic, I have convened four distinguished, distinguished, really distinguished speakers, experts who will, um, uh, take, who, who will take up the very important topics and, and let me introduce very briefly four speakers uh, today. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, as always, we ask Dr. Said Ghanem, uh, Senior Strategist and the Chairman of the Institute of Global Security and Defense Affairs, IGSDA, for the keynote speak. Um, even though we have many very uh, strong speakers now. So um, he kindly uh, accepted to uh, keep his uh, presentation of keynote very short, like seven minutes. But uh, um, as always, he actually, he always sent me very thick volume of food paper. And actually that's one of the sources for me to uh, foresee the our situation in the Middle East. So, uh, so his presentation today would be very short, but um, the entire series of these seminars uh, is actually um, uh, inspired by, by 
him uh, by his very insightful, uh, uh, you know, uh, thesis. So, uh, so first speaker is, of course, as always, Dr. Said Ghanim, and, and we have three guests today. Uh, one is um, Mr. Ahmed El Duraini. Uh, he's a very you know, young and famous journalist in Egypt. Um, he has been, um, and he is a documentary producer and a TV presenter. And uh, currently he heads the documentary unit at DMC Network, uh, private venture in, in the vibrant Egyptian media, uh, wh which is uh, situated based in Cairo, Egypt. And Dr. Mohamed El Gindi, he is a, a cybersecurity expert and also TV presenter. He has his own uh, TV you know, uh, uh, program. Um, his governmental appointment includes cybersecurity advisor to the assistant of the prime minister of Egypt and digital transformation expert of the public prosecution office. Uh, he's also the director of operations at the IGSDA. And last but not least, Professor Samih S. Ali is a global health security expert and the head of the research unit of oncology Children's Cancer Hospital uh, 57357 in Cairo, which is a very experimental advanced hospital uh, established in Cairo. Professor Ali, uh, Sam Ali obtained his Master of Science and PhD degrees from Tohoku University in Japan. So uh, we may uh, say, you know, welcome back. And he spent three years as a postdoctoral fellow at uh, in the Technical University of Graz and also Washington University in St. Louis. Um, so um, uh, today we have very, very, you know, uh, uh, strong uh, presenters presentation. So we quickly move on to the first uh, presentation by uh, Major General Dr. Said Ghanem. Uh, Said, it's your turn, please. Okay. Uh, so now I will share this, my very short one. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Satoshi. Uh, now it's coming for full screen. Yeah. So, new frontiers of national security. What are the origins of the threats? I would like to say something, why this, why I'm talking about this right now. In my PhD thesis and also in my book, I made like recommendations. It's common, you know, that the national security elements or dimensions, they are commonly four, and it can be known as the vital interest of a common nature. If you would like to describe any national security interest, it's like, how can I say, it is, if you don't protect it, if you put your all your efforts to preserve this kind of national security, so your country will be exposed to destructions, or at least to not to be, which is inability, to not to be able to be disabled to do its jobs, partially or collectively. So, and the common national interests which are known in our region, many four. I mean, in our countries, political security, economic security, military security, and social security. Each of them may, if we don't protect them, if we are harming, so it may lead to destruction of the country, or at least to be unable to do its functions. Some other national security elements are there, but especially United States and other modern, modern country, or, no, or civilized, or let me say developed countries. However, so if origins came from where? I noticed something, I'm not a specialist in cybersecurity, but I could learn it from Dr. Muhammad and others, that the mainly that it's, you know, everything now is digitalized, I can say. So we have the digital government. And Dr. Gandhi really participated in that in several fields like uh, General Prosecution Office and Justice, Minister of Justice. He also participated 
in, in prime minister cabinet, the cabinet itself is supporting this issue. So and you can see all services in several countries in our region now digitalized. And remember, there is the, what you call it, the dark internet, the deep internet, uh, and even the digital coins, all of this, all of this make the country and institutions are exposed for direct threat. And if really big threat happen, as always I learned from him and others, that it will make the country enable to do its jobs. When we see COVID-19, it's known to everybody, the planet became paralyzed, the economy came down and uh, the souls, the lives of the people. So suppose that small countries, small population, when they are mostly infected with this pandemic, so what will happen? Not only economy, but the human power, which is the main source of Japan, for example, to do everything. So a big population like Egypt, for example, is the biggest population in the Arab nations. So this will be very effective and really may destroy the country directly. And then media. Media is a point of media that it, 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 it deals directly with, which I call it, if I'm not wrong or right in my English, collective awareness. Collective awareness, which really design or make the, the people's will, the will of the people. So if it's misled, or I can say absent, it should be lightened. So by media, then it would really destroy, oh, which I said that it will take you to a big, big, big troubles, which can no country at all can endure them. So can we add some of them to our national security elements? Here is the point. Which one of them is really eligible? So I can say that I think at least, at least cybersecurity and health security, they are affecting. Media is a tool which affects social security, but I think it has to be taken very seriously. And why I say that? Because when you say it's an element of the national security of the country, so big budget, big efforts, big concentration must come from the country, maybe specific authority or ministry or something to be responsible, and then it will be taken care of, not, not just like any element among the main element of national security. This comes with something. Always I say human power is very important. The human himself or herself is very important. That's why I put my own definition of national security. All national, this is my last slide anyway. So all national securities uh, definitions, which really I met everywhere. Let me say tens of them. They care about two main points, fear and needs, which is right, it's correct. This is how to protect my national security, how to avoid any fear, any threat from my country and to make my country, you know, have so what's sufficient to make it people at least alive. But here is the point, I see it very passive, very passive view to the national security, why? If you would like to be a doctor like our doctors, so you want to have a very high mark, let me say 90%, let me say outstanding. So you have to work on 100% mark to get a little bit less. But if you work only what satisfy you like to make your people secured or to make your people not hungry, so you are working on something like basic level which could be not a true target. I think the true target to make your country prosper. And prosperity comes from development. It comes from freedom. It comes from creativity. You have to be improved. So the national security definition must concentrate on creativity. How to make you really wealthy, not for your people, but for other countries even around you which we can even in social to make charity, whatever you can consider it. So we have to think in a definition which can make our needs, not just, not the main goal, 
but our happiness, our prosperity. So the needs here will be very something you have exceeded, I can say. And if I come to the other point, the fear, you know, it's not the main goal to avoid fear. Like for example, which is the last example now, digitalization, as I mentioned, it's not a challenge. It's not a challenge. It's something like advantage. We, we, we shouldn't be afraid of that. We have to meet all the new technologies. When I see new tools of media and people are afraid of them, they are afraid of house club, they are afraid of uh, social media, they are afraid of Twitter and Facebook. No, we should deal with everything. If you even consider it as tool of the enemy, make your enemy closer to you than your friend. So you have to deal with the threats as if you are turning risks to opportunity. Here is all my points and my view, and we will listen for my colleagues, which really element could be a part of uh, national security. And by the way, Egypt in its constitution 2014, it's added cybersecurity as one of the main national security of the country. It's article number, if I'm not wrong, number 31. And in, uh, uh, in, in, it's, it's very, very clear, but I hope to consider other elements as well to all countries, not only my country. Thank you so much, this is all from my side. Thank you, Dr. Said, as always, a very uh, succinctly uh, uh, summarizing the, the uh, entire situation and framework. And um, yes, um, I, I cannot help but asking you many questions, but um, today I, you know, <laughs> refrain from it. So um, uh, Egypt, how Egypt is, is, is coping, you know, with mm, um, digital economy, digital, you know, technology and uh, um, it, it, this is the you know main focal point of, of our discussion today, I, I think. And uh, also, I have you know just two points in mind. You know, where is the Egypt strength? In my answer is it's middleness. You know, middle class. It's thick middle class, and uh, it's uh, you know youth. So youth is not uh, usually Egyptian youth is, is you know. Um, recognized as part of the main problem, but actually Egyptian youth and there are the quality or education quality varies, very varies. But um, the they are very strong and vibrant, so it poses some you know problems sometimes. But it will be eventually the the resource. Um, ultimate resource for the country and for the region. So um, today I uh, invite um, young journalists uh, in the documentary producer uh, who is now working in one of the very vibrant uh, media company in Egypt. So Mr. Ahmed El Dereini, um, would, you, would you give us your presentation? Okay, good morning for everyone and good afternoon for uh, others in other uh, cities around the world. Uh, I'm Ahmed Al-Drini, I'm an Egyptian journalist, TV presenter, and the head of documentary Yonit at DMC, the largest Egyptian cable network. This is my first time to give a lecture in English, uh, in English language. Therefore, please forgive me if my ideas were not clear enough or my performance didn't match your expectations. I'll be talking today about the challenges that face my generation in the Arab media from my perspective. All the challenges in my opinion are related to the Arab Spring and what it brought to the whole region. The first challenge has to do with key definitions such as who is our enemy? My generation is experiencing a new enemy to the nation. Let me elaborate. In the past, particularly in my father's and grandfather's generation, they had a main known enemy. For example, they entered three wars against Israel. There was some diplomatic tension with some Western countries. But for my generation, the definition of the word enemy became different. 
After the Arab Spring, many countries in the region, and my country is one of them, fought against the political Islam groups or extremists. And the countries are supporting them as Turkey and Qatar. During these fights or wars, certain kind of questions appeared in the public sphere, such as who is actually our enemy? Why does each side have their own national narrative and methods? What do we actually want from tomorrow? This chaos of definitions, concepts, and understandings in the first challenge that faced me as a TV presenter. These questions, the questions of who are you? Who are we as a nation? All these unanswered questions and doubts represents challenges when you try to approach the current affair. How to understand what is going around you? What is your point of view? How to be professional and impartial? Millions of Egyptians, myself included, have doubts about the main political players in the scene. Inside Egypt and, sorry, <clears throat> inside Egypt and outside. All we want is to protect our country. And everyone is exploring his own way after witnessing two revolutions in Egypt with all the mess and chaos associated with both of them. How do my work as TV presenter and the columnist amid all these polarizations in the public sphere and amid the absence of a fully credibly institution that has the ability to unify the nation? While one, while no one or institution has the fully credibility or even ability to unify the nation, I'm not talking about the uh, new Messiah whom we will follow toward the good and justice and noble principles. I'm not talking about a leader, person, a person or a governmental body or a political party. I mean this public idea or dream or direction the nation decide to abide with. I'm not talking specifically about who are the enemies of my country. All of these are just tumbles of the uncertainty towards many things. Me and millions of, of, of the nation have doubts about what is going on. This is part of awkwardness and redefinition of values after witnessing two revolution. Obviously, I'm not talking about certain enemy or opponent and not searching for one, I'm not searching for an enemy to define. I'm just trying to explore who am I? The nations must probably define itself by its achievements or its enemies. What I mean here is the principle of redefining concepts itself. My generation is, to, is trying to find new answers for all the questions. All of these make you as a journalist awkward when you try to approach the current affair, how to understand, how to tackle, what to say to people, how to build your opinion, how to tell people this is the truth or this is my analyze for what is going on. The second challenge face me is post-truth era. We are living under heavy flow of information. Everyone chooses from bombarding news and posts on social media. Some are fake news. What enhance their previous concepts, not what make them reach the truth. The social media produced a world where everyone has his own version of truth about the world and about his country and his very little own word in the village or even the company he or she works on. Social media made it, to make it, made it harder to people working in media to differentiate about what is real and what is fake. In Egypt, we have an addition problem, which is the electronic committees that aim to create an impression of widespread grassroots support for individual or policies or even attacking them. They are professional hired internet users who have access to 100,000 of fake accounts and they have agreements with some influencers who have remarkable impact in shaping public opinion. 
electronic committees are being hired by main political powers to their opponents or their opponents to hijack the social media trends or create one or even fake them. Electronic committees can set the timeline, choose the topics that will invade your account from everywhere and tackle these topics the way they want you to believe is the truth or the justice or the God. Each player has his own agenda and own definitions and own values, regardless the topic is political or religious or social. How to seek truth in such environment an environment? How to be balanced in your coverage as a professional? How to adopt the professional tools when you deal with such a confusing and artificial world? The powers that control media after two revolutions in region are meant with setting the agenda that comes with their own version of truth or even their version of nationalism. I mean with the powers, governments, non-state actors, businessmen, political leaders. You are trying to be balanced, professional, and abiding the, nation, the national interest while each power in the scene has their way to define what is national interest and how should balance and the professionalism serve the nation interest, the national interest, not the opposite. I'm trying to be a part of, I'm trying not to be a part of this mess, examining the tools, ethics, and the traditions of media industry that guarantee providing the audience with the truth and guaranteeing my integrity. The third challenge, the, the, the third challenge facing my generation is the fluidity. As a TV presenter in a new world where many things are going to be different compared with the last two decades, I face my generation third challenge. What is fluidity? Fluidity is when you're not being able to describe the truth to know the truth. We face foggy environment in news and social media makes us can't realize what is good and what is bad. And as we did before, before we can know what is good and what is bad. These challenges might seem as social or political symptoms after revolutions and wars. This is true. But when you try to tackle the impact of symptoms you might appear as a doctor who wastes, wastes the patient time studying the illness and ignoring prescribing a medicine or finding a cure. Although all the challenges I mentioned now, I'm very optimistic about the future and sure that the empire will strike back because of the awareness of the questions and, many, and that the truth has many sides. We didn't obey to any of them. We are explore, exploring the truth, realizing that the nation is in a need for really warriors for truth, not repeaters of political opponents narrative. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, I'm done. Thank you very much, Ahmed, um, for your, you know, uh, how can I say, it's a very grave, you know, your, your note, uh, tone uh, of your presentation speech is very, you know, grave, you know. Um, I really uh, sincerely um, um, accept it, you know. Um, now you have mentioned three very, very important challenges Egypt, Egyptian society and particularly Egyptian youth are faced with, and um, those are very important. Um, and, and other media personality, you um, you are very brave to address us um, on, on these issues, and uh, I really really um, thank you uh, for 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 that. Yeah. And um, um, we, I think we have you know very important three uh, topics today, and they are separate, uh, even though they are interrelated. So. Um, may, may I uh, ask um, you very briefly uh, from the, the floor, uh, the, the question, you know, after this representation, we make 
no, discussion and uh, also uh, uh, within the uh, during the discussion um, questions are taken for three presentations but uh, if someone has specific question on, on media and uh, uh, Egyptian media uh, uh, particularly uh, um, would, would you raise your hand um, if someone want to you know Oh, uh, oh no! Uh, uh, for our audience, uh, no, no. From the audience, uh, I want to ask if we have any questions, uh, particularly on the Egyptian media. Uh, would you raise your, you know, blue hand or, 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 or on Zoom or, or application? Is there any questions? Um, it, it's a very rare opportunity to ask the the new generation of Egyptian media to. And uh, uh, media in, the, um, in Egypt has been very, very influential and still it's influential. Uh, even though nowadays we have um, too much attention, you know, uh, on, on Gulf media. And, and really in, in the Gulf, there have been a rise of and the concentration of new media industry. But I, I think Egypt still keeps its position of the you know, very deep resource uh, uh, for the, the resource for, for the development, development of media, uh, not only in, in the Nile Valley, but uh, uh, in the entire Middle East. So, um, so yeah, you have, you know, Ahmed, you, you have mentioned, uh, you know, of course, the entire presentation about your exploration of the situation right after the Arab Spring. And, uh, um, you, you know, um, for the young generation, young generation, the professionals like you, uh, the, uh, the 10 years after Arab Spring, well, uh, you know, what, what is your, uh, present assessment of the Arab Spring. You know, it's 10 years, so it's a generational change is going on and uh, Arab Spring is associated with so-called youth, youth at the time, but now after 10 years, um, the youth who participated in the Arab Spring uh, and, um, you know, the, uh, and the uh, political change after that. Uh, how do you, you know, assess the past ten years, uh, Ahmed? If you have further, you know, comments on that, um, it, it would be very appreciated. Uh, after one decade, mm -hmm. after the Arab Spring, you have many generations in Egypt. Each generation has. Uh, its own problem and its own benefit from the Arab Spring. The younger generation in Egypt, I think, I claim, uh, is very different from us, uh, who uh, we are the, the generation where in the squares shouting against re regimes uh, and have our own uh, narrative uh, toward the world. What is good, what is bad, what, is, uh, what we want from our country. Uh, there are there is a generation a new generation have a new dream and they are considering us uh, something from the past although we are uh, the generation uh, excluded the uh, previous generations and uh, said they are uh, the cause of uh, uh, a broken country we now we are uh, part of uh, part of uh, this uh, new world uh, the, the, the younger generation uh, is furious from us. Uh, but the future, I think, uh, will be managed by, uh, by new awareness, new awareness of uh, the, global, uh, the global citizen, the coming global citizen who, have, uh, who has interest in what is going on in Japan and what is in the United States and what is in Europe, what is Clubhouse, what is Facebook, what is democracy, what is good, what is bad. Uh, you have uh, a new era of uh, global awareness 
uh, I think uh, this will affect politically the point of view of the coming generation in Egypt. Me and the previous generations now are old fashioned. Hmm, interesting. Um, but uh, this global, you know, uh, Sophia, you know, you, um, as you mentioned, as you mentioned, as a challenge, um, there are full of, you know, fake news and full of fluidity. Um, so uh, do you think, you know, new generation of Egypt are, you know, you, uh, oh, you know, uh, new, the new generation is more, you know, uh, good, you know, good at uh, grappling with the, this new uh, situation, like, you know, full of, of fake, fake news and uh, full of, of uncertainty and fluidity. Uh, do, do you think they are equipped with The coming generation is part of what is happening in the world. Uh, all, uh, all the coming generation uh, is familiar with what is happening. We are old mammoth, old mammoth who witnessed the world with just one or two channels in the TV. And we were read, we were, uh, we have been reading uh, the same newspapers. We are, we have a nostalgia for a world, for an old world where truth were very clear. But the new generation, I think they are a part of uh, this dilemma around the world. This generation in Russia, Europe, Africa, uh, Latin America, Asia have the same problem. And this is the world toward them. But I have exper an experience with another world, with another world which where we had the main two narratives, even if the Russian narrative and the American narrative, uh, when uh, each country has uh, somehow a big narrative about who are we, who is our enemies, uh, who are our enemies and what is good and what is bad uh, but uh, the chaos is uh, is a feature of their life now mm. Mm. i think they don't suffer like us mm. Mm. thank you very much for your assessment of the present situation so um we we move on to the next presentation by dr mohammed um Elugindi. um he is a cyber security expert and uh, who is also a media personality. And um, so uh, Dr. Mohammed um, Elgindi, uh, oh, would, would you start your presentation, please? Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Satoshi, and thanks for everyone. And uh, it's, it's a good opportunity to, uh, to be with you. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, Dr. Syed, you know, started the keynote speech with uh, connecting the dots. And I think uh, we, we, are, we are living in an interdisciplinary world right now. So uh, let me share my presentation and we, we can discuss later what, what I mean by the, the interdisciplinary uh, uh, world. So please let me know if you see my screen. Yes, uh, we can see it. Okay, let me go with the full uh, screen. Um, this is the PowerPoint. I sent you the PDF because of the videos in the in the presentation. And uh, the title of the presentation is, uh, um, you know, the cybercrime in the Middle East, the social, political, and economic issues. Um, why I I tried to to speak about uh, the entire Middle East, not only in Egypt. Egypt will, will be part of the presentation at the end of the presentation. But uh, why I choose the uh, Middle East because, um, you know the. The issue of the cybersecurity, I think it is connected in the Middle East. It is the same issues which is, uh, you know, arising in different countries in the Middle East. Um, we can see some kind of similarities between countries in, in, in the Middle East. So what we are going to face in the, the near future and what we are facing now in the cybersecurity is very, you know, similar in, in different countries in, in, in the Middle East. So I will not speak about myself again, but I just want to ask, uh, all the audience, uh, this question is, um, are we living in, in the Matrix? I think you, you watched the, the, the movie Matrix um, in 1999, I think, you know, 91, I don't remember the date, but this is the, it's an old movie. Um, most people are now thinking of the concept of the Matrix uh, movie. So let's re remember, uh, you know, a, a little part of the Matrix movie and to see, if we are really living in the matrix right now. Yeah. 
Have you ever had a dream, Neo, that you were so sure was real? What if you were unable to wake from that dream? How would you know the difference between the dream world and the real world? What is the Matrix? It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. Let's stop the hype at this level, but I just want to uh, remember the movie uh, Matrix because um, most people uh, didn't understand that uh, this day that uh, this movie, you know, had a very, very important concept, which is uh, the cyberspace, which is we, we are living here now. And also, we, if we are talking about uh, the science fiction movies, I will not forget Japan for, for, for sure, because, you know, Japan is a big culture when it comes to to cyberpunk movies uh something like uh, ghost on the chill and all those good movies that we have you know influenced by in the science fiction uh, domain um the, the most people um don't know maybe that uh, the matrix movie is based on a uh a, a novel by william gibson uh 1982 uh, it's called the new romancer this 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 is the very very important also in the novel which is the first in the first time that someone uh, you know mentioned the cyberspace and um, if if we um, try to understand what William Gibson uh, tried to explain what the cyberspace is which is the matrix uh, he, he he described it as a consensual hallucination experienced daily by billions of legitimate operators in every nation by children being taught mathematical concepts to graphic representation of data abstracted from banks of every computer in the human system so if you think of this concept, I think we we are living in the matrix. Even if you if you watch it, the, the the trailer again, he was asked about uh, uh, the matrix. Is in in matrix you don't understand and you don't differentiate what's true and what's false. And maybe this is also reflected on what we are facing now in cyberspace, especially in the media, as uh, my friend uh, Mr. Ahmed just uh, mentioned about the fake news and all those things. So it's 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 connected. Everything is connected now. So and uh, when it comes to connectivity, I will not forget to mention the force in the serial revolution. And uh, um, it's the beginning of revolution that's changing everything now. We are now uh, thinking of the connectivity of everything. The new economy that's based on the you know the the, the new industries that's shaping the, the, the new um, uh, world of connecting everything to everything. Um, you know, talking machines to each other, um, data that's, um, you know, going through from machine to machine and, uh, you know, things that are connecting the, the physical world to the logical world. And that comes also to the new uh, idea of the digital world, which is, in my opinion, is, um, there is a, a blurring between the lines of the digital and physical world. So we don't now able, you know, appreciate, differentiate between the, the physical and, the, you know, the, the the logical world. If you are living in with your mind in a cyberspace, you don't even, um, you know, understand how things are going on the in the physical world because it is connecting and the cyberspace is affecting the, the you know, the physical world. And that's how the digital world is 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 going to affect our lives in the future, and this is will have, you know, major consequences. So when it comes to to Middle East, from my point of view, that uh, there's some characteristics of the you know the cyberspace in the Middle East different from other uh, areas in the world. Uh, one of the the major things is uh, internet penetration in the Middle East. Internet penetration in the Middle East is. Uh, if, you know, according to the statistics, is uh, it's outpacing the rest of the world. When when we are comparing the statistics of 2008, for example, this is uh, was mentioned in my research. That's why I I mentioned 2008. And uh, when we are comparing it with 2019 statistics, we will find that's uh, a huge difference in you know growth of user uh, on the internet in the Middle East and also the penetration of the the internet among the you know the uh, users in the in the countries so internet penetration is is you know uh, according to the statistics it's about 70% of the population and this is very uh, you know very large numbers so 
the situation in the Middle East when it comes to cyber crime, for example, um, I, I published an article in 2008 in ICC uh, Journal, which is the largest uh, information system security association in the world. Um, it was in 2008, I was trying to predict what will happen in the Middle East when it comes to cyber crime. Um, I found in, in, in my research that there is, um, you know, uh, special characteristics of the cyber crime uh, in, in the Middle East because of the key reasons that will increase the problem in the future. That was in 2008. Right? So now we are in, you know, 2021. And I think the, the issues is, is not different. So we are talking about the state of ICT infrastructure in the Middle East. Most people in the Middle East thinking of business first, safety later. And this is, this is a big issue. And we are still facing these things now. Uh, the growth of user base. So we are witnessing growth of user base in everywhere in the Middle East, especially uh, when we are talking about digitalization, digital transformation, and all those things. Uh, smart cities, uh, any, everywhere in the Middle East, people are connecting to the internet. So we have also poor security awareness programs. So we, we don't have proper security awareness programs in the Middle East, uh, unfortunately. Uh, when it comes to regulation, and I will talk later about the regulation, even you, you, you find a poor regulation, or, or no regulation at all. So this is also a big issue in, when it comes to cybercrime in the Middle East. Uh, also, lack of training for, for you know, a law enforcement, a judiciary system, civil societies, and all people who are you know, dealing with, it, with such a threat in, in the 21st centuries. Uh, also, we are dependent on the off-the-shelf system solutions, and this is, this is a big issue because you have a black box. You don't understand how these things are operating and uh, what's the vulnerabilities inside these systems. So especially systems that are, you know, connected to the critical infrastructure. Uh, also, we have financial problems in most countries in the Middle East and also the political problems when we go back to the so-called Arab Spring, as, as my friend just mentioned uh, right now. And uh, the last thing is the terrorism, which is, I think all of you understand how terrorism is, is, is working in the, in the Middle East. These all things that are creating the, the characteristic of the, of the cyber crime in the Middle East. All people, you know, all criminals in the Middle East are, are, are online right now. When we are talking about conventional crimes, talking about cyber crime, the true cyber crime, when we are talking about terrorism, organized crime, all those are connected now uh, in, in, in the Middle East. When it comes to economic uh, issues, we economic cost of the cybercrime, according to the World Economic Forum, uh, it was about uh, $445 uh, billion uh, of, uh, you know, um, loss to, to the economy because of the cybercrime. It's, uh, you know, it was projected to reach $2, tri $2 trillion uh, dollars by by 2019 and now in 2021 we are talking about six trillion dollar in cost for cybercrime so this is this is big numbers that's because we are all now you know the world is moving to the digital transformation to connecting everything and this is will increase the problem of the you know the economic problem of the cybercrime so the problem also with the cybercrime is uh, the definition there is no internationally agreed definition of cybercrime and this is a big issue when it comes to regulation, when it comes also to people who are talking about uh, law, laws and, and uh, regulation in, in the region, especially in the region, because we don't understand maybe the, the, the true concept of the cyberspace. We are talking about cybercrime as something, you know, um, like the traditional crime. It's not like this because we have different meaning for, of the cybercrime. We have the narrow uh, definition of cybercrime, and, uh, which is true. Um, cybercrime, which is the, the computer-dependent crimes, like hacking, um, malware, and DDoS attacks, and all those things. And we have also the broader uh, meaning of cybercrime, which is, I think, it's the, the main, you know, use of the term cybercrime in most uh, regulations in, in, in the Middle East, and also maybe around the world, because they are describing everything that's happening on cyberspace is a cybercrime. But this, this is not true because you know traditional crime is different they are using the internet it is not dependent on the internet it, you know you can commit the crime without the internet that's why it's not cyber crime so um something from the middle east uh, there is an organized crime that rings that connected and uh, targeting the middle east this is one of the the the, the famous uh, you know crime ring that stole about 45 million dollars from two banks in the middle east the National Bank of Russell Khaimah and Bank of Muscat, 
and uh, those guys were you know working in an organized crime in a transnational crime and targeted banks in the, in the in the middle east so the middle east is a target for organized crime because of the you know uh, prosperity and in economy especially in countries like united arab emirates and uh, saudi arabia and all the you know oil countries as we call it uh, this uh, another example from uh, Egypt. This is an organized crime ring, but this time is originated from Middle East. This one, uh, you know, was uh, in Egypt, and uh, this is about nearly uh, 50 Egyptian citizens have been charged in this, uh, you know, organized uh, crime ring, and they stole about 1.5 uh, million uh, US dollar from uh, Bank of uh, America and uh, in the United States, and. Uh, uh, another example is the cyber espionage uh, operations. When we are talking about targeting the Middle East, we will mostly find cyber espionage as a big player in the, in the, the cyber domain. So this is one of the biggest operations that, uh, you know, it targeted many countries in the Middle East, which is called the, the Operation Parliament. Um, the last thing that I was talking about in, in my research in 2008 is it, now a big issue in, in, in cyberspace, which is the radicalization and the, the, you know, terrorism in, in, in cyberspace. So we have um, many materials online now, uh, you know, uh, youth can be radicalized easily uh, in, on cyberspace and we have many people who are, you know, posting videos on, on YouTube and the other social medias that are trying to radicalize the youth in, in the Middle East. And this is a big issue that is now happening in the Middle East. And I think with the fall of the of the ISIL or, or Daesh, people are now moving to, to use the internet more properly to recruit and fundraise many um, terrorist organizations. Uh, also, we have uh, people who, who are, you know, uh, like Anwar Lawlaki, for example, he's now dead. But, uh, but, but uh, you know his legacy is online because there is a lot of materials and magazines and guides that's used by many people around the world, not only in the Middle East, to create bombs, for example, to inspire many people to 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 join terrorist organizations and how to make bombs and things like this in manuals and very very uh, glossy materials in the, mid, in, the, in the in the cyberspace. Uh, social media is, is, is very important for terrorism. For example, now we are seeing propaganda psychological operations uh, on, on social media, cyber attacks, uh, intelligence gathering, training, fundraising, radicalization, recruitment, communication, all those things are you know, used by terrorist organizations now in the, in, the, in the Middle East and cyberspace. When it comes to state-sponsored attacks that targeted Middle East, we, we see that uh, there is um, a big player in, in, the, in the Middle East, which is Iran. Iran, they have the, their own, you know, uh, cyber troops, and they are working very, very actively in cyberspace, targeting, uh, uh, you know, uh, countries and uh, critical infrastructures, and they're trying to, uh, you know, steal information from different countries in the Middle East because it's, it's connected to a political um, issues uh, uh, this time, like this attack that targeted Aramco and Rasgas in 2012. So we are talking about uh, Iran, and uh, we will not forget to talk about Stuxnet because they, they were hit by Stuxnet and uh, they learned a lot from Stuxnet. They reverse engineered the code and they created their own, uh, you know, arsenal of cyber weapons based on the code of the Stuxnet. And this is you know, created too much issues in the Middle East because um, Iran targeted the Middle East infrastructure with 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 those um, you know uh, new tools that is based on the code of the Stuxnet that was created mainly in Iran, like Shmoon virus, Flame, Doku, and the Triton. All those viruses or malware are based on the reverse engineered code of the Stuxnet, and 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 this is one of the the thing that. Iran has benefited from the, the Stuxnet. They, you know, they use the code to target other uh, countries in the in the Middle East. And this is a big issue when it comes to critical infrastructure, because, in, as I as I mentioned, um, most countries in the Middle East install the technology and forget about it. And this is, a, you know, a challenge because critical infrastructure is connected to everything. And it's now connected to, in some way or another, to a network. And this network is connected to an indirect or direct connection to the internet. And this is big 
um, issues for, for our critical infrastructure. And um, um, the critical infrastructure is mainly connected to something called the SCADA, SCADA systems, which is the supervisory control and data acquisition or the industrial control systems. All those things are controlled by computers. So if you manage to update the software or the update uh, some kind of code in, in this uh, uh, computer that's connected to the SCADA systems, you can create you know, a disaster in, in the critical infrastructure. And this is not a theory, but you, you, what, you know witnesses Stuxnet and we, we are uh, about to watch this. This is an experiment uh, created by the National Security Agency in the United States in 2007 about how to use a code to uh, destroy, to, to physically destroy an gener electric generator and how to, to, you know, if we manipulated the code uh, to uh, destroy the, the, the electric uh, grid. So and I see we, we have witnessed many uh, situations in Ukraine, for example, and in different countries in, uh, in Europe and also in the United States, how hackers are, you know, manipulated the industrial control systems to, uh, to broke the, the, the physical components of electrical grids. It's destroyed. So this is a clear example. Now the problem is with when it comes to more connectivity, we are more more vulnerable to uh, to threats. So people now are asking, uh, you know, they are not asking why this this thing or this device is connected to the internet. They are mostly asking why these things are not connected to the internet. And this is the problem because we are connecting and uh, you know don't uh, you know. Um, uh, do the proper thing to secure these things. And I think the Internet of Things will be the Internet of insecure things in the future and will be, you know, will be hit with, with, with many cyber attacks in, in the future. And all people, you know, on these all categories can do the, 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 the problem to the critical infrastructure, like the hacktivists, for example. And uh, as you may know, hacktivists are, you know, people who are, um, you know, hacking for a political reason. It's a, a, you know, a connection between hacking and uh, activism. And also we have this, the cyber criminals and the terrorists and the nation states. So all those players are you know, attacking critical infrastructure right now. When it comes to law, um, we are speaking about the international experiment of law when it comes to cyber crime. We have the Bodebist Treaty or the Convention on Cyber Crime. Uh, and the, for the Council of Europe, uh, which is uh, drafted 2001, now many countries are, you know, joining uh, Budapest Treaty in order to get information about cyber criminals, um, you know, around the world. I think, it, you know, there is a lot of countries outside the Council of Europe are also, you know, uh, ratified the, the Budapest Treaty. When it comes to United Nations, we have the Security Council Resolution uh, 2341. Uh, where that was speaking explicitly about the, the cyber terrorism and the, you know uh, uh, targeting the critical infrastructure and countries need to pay attention to to these kind of things and uh, you know draft legislations that protect the critical infrastructure. Also, we have uh, this General Assembly in 2018. The United Nations General Assembly uh, res uh, adopted a resolution uh, about countering the use of information and communication technologies for criminal purposes. Um, you know, 85 countries voted for this resolution and uh, 55 countries voted against it. And, uh, you know, uh, 29 countries uh, retrained. And this is, uh, you know, uh, explained the problem of the, of the cyber crime definition around the world, because what you, um, it's the same as terrorism, by the way. If you, uh, you know, um, uh, consider this one is a criminal or a terrorist, some, someone else around the world maybe consider it uh, a hero or uh, a freedom fighter. And that's why the, the, this issue is not easy in, in the international level. When it comes to Egypt, uh, General Said just uh, mentioned the Egyptian constitution. We have Article uh, 31 about protecting the cyberspace. Um, this, is, this is not, from my opinion, from my technical opinion, it's not a, a proper translation to, to the article because the article was talking about uh, the you know uh, information space and uh, you know cyberspace is different so cyberspace 
is not the internet and the internet is not the, the, the information sphere as we call it. But this article is, 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 is in the Egyptian constitution. Also, we have the, the legal framework uh, uh, related to combating IT crimes or cyber crime, IT crime. This is what the law called it. And this is why I said that uh, the problem of the definition is is, is everywhere in, in the Middle East. Um, it, there is no you know, clear definition of cyber crime. And this is a big issue when it comes to uh, legal instruments. We have also in Egypt, the national cyber security strategy uh, and the, you know, the drafted uh, pillars for the, the strategy and um, like, for example, protecting the critical infrastructure, uh, creating, um, you know, uh, capacity building programs. And I think from my, from my point of view, and I'm not here speaking about any governmental entities that I'm working in, uh, in, my, uh, over, in my point of view as an expert, I think that we need to revisit the strategy of the cybersecurity, or the national cybersecurity, because it, from my opinion, is, it's not proper right now. So my last recommendation, and I'm very sorry if I talk too much time, um, my recommendations for the, the issues in, in, in Egypt or even in the Middle East, I think we need a proper cyber laws that's really dealing with the real threats that we are facing now in cyberspace, even with things that's er it's in interconnected like fake news and all those things that we are talking about now as a threat to the national security. Um, we need also to adopt the international standards, uh, framework, and best practice for cybersecurity. This is, you know, uh, a, th a very important thing that I don't, I do not find, um, I cannot find it in the Middle East. Um, there is no um, international framework that's adopted in cybersecurity. For example, we have NIST, we have ENISA in Europe, we have, uh, you know, other standards that we can use as a framework to draft something for international standard that can be adopted in the Middle East. Um, people are talking about ISO and all those things, but from my point of view, this is you know a checklist. We are, we are not talking about checklist. We need to to create a framework for for cybersecurity in the, in the in the Middle East and in the region. Also, we need the proper uh, capacity building programs that's compatible with what we're going now in the in in the advancement in cyberspace. Also, we need to promote international cooperation, and this is a very important you know, um, uh, point to, to consider when we are talking about dealing with advanced countries or developed countries like Japan that can help in, you know, uh, coordinating some kind of uh, cooperation when it comes to cyberspace and also the, the, the important legacy of Japan when it comes to technology because Japan is, is very important and very pivot, important pivotal country in this um, uh, thing. And uh, Japan from my work and also in the United Nations, uh, experience. I, I know that Japan is 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 very important country in the United Nations when it comes to uh, you know supporting uh, capacity building programs for countering terror terrorism and also cyber crime in the, in the, around the world. I, I need to 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 stress that we we need all of us need to think globally. We we, we are not in, in in isolated in in the 21st century. We need to think globally how to cooperate together in the 21st century. And my last word is a quote from uh, the, the cybersecurity expert, Prof. Schneer, uh, when, when we said, uh, if we think, if you think technology can solve your security problems, then you don't understand the problems and you don't understand the technology. And this is the truth. People are looking for technology, not everything else. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohamed Ergindi, for your very comprehensive uh, presentation uh, of the cyberspace development and the Egyptian you know, development in, in this field. And, um, uh, you know, uh, just just quick, quick question from me, uh, abusing my, my prerogative as a uh, moder moderator, you know, um, the so-called Arab Spring in 2011, was you know always associated with the quick expansion of you know new digital media, particularly among youth at that time, and in a way the the um, um, penetration of of of, of I, you know IT uh, information technology to the our younger generation outpaced the 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 policy. Yeah. 
from the government. Yeah. So uh, it, it was a very, very rare moment in history. It was 10 years ago. In your assessment, you know, now after a decade, is there any such kind of new discrepancy or, you know, is there any, any you know, possibility or, or danger, uh, you know, such kind of, uh, um, you know, out, outpacing or, or it will, will take place? You know, it, it, what, what do you see the, the real, you know, danger uh, or, or possibility of crisis uh, again? Do, do you foresee such kind of crisis in the near future? Uh, I think that uh, the crisis is is not about you know um, uh, a new uh, so-called Arab Spring, but I think the, the the crisis in in the in the future, and I think is it's, it's the current crisis. Is, I think is um, the loss of identity online. So so when we are talking about young generation, for example, they don't have you know a proper compass because of the, all of the things that are going on in the cyberspace and the, there is no guidance uh, from the government. Uh, I, I'm not speaking about Egypt, I'm speaking about the governments and, and all. If we are speaking about governments, there is no guidance for, for cyberspace. Even there is no, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, guides even in the schools how to, to deal with, with cyberspace when it comes to uh, digital literacy, for example, you, you see that all those generations, young generations are digitally native, but from my perspective, they are, they are illiterate and digitally illiterate. They, they need to be, you know, they, have, they need to have literacy, how to use uh, digital uh, components, how to be digitally literate. And this is, I think this is the, the most important thing that you know, governments need to work on, how to make those young generations working in a proper compass, and how also to uh, create guidance for using uh, the proper use of the cyberspace. And this will also will protect us from things like fake news and all those things. But, uh, but this, is, this is not available, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for really, you know, your informative, uh, 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 you know, a comment. And uh, we, we uh, quickly move on to the next presentation and then we'll come back to the all the presentation for discussion and um next um presenter is professor uh, sam ali and uh, um of course we are now uh, commonly inflicted upon this global crisis of covid-19 and uh, uh, it's uh, your presentation would be very uh, important and interesting uh, uh, addition for us uh, um, showing us the the Egyptian response, the Middle Eastern response to this common crisis. So, please, um, Professor Sam Hari. I think he is muted. All right. So, uh, sorry for that. Uh, okay. uh, can you see my presentation? It's really a pleasure and honor, um, and also it's a great responsibility to be here with you, all of you. And I really should extend my thanks to uh, Professor Satoshi and also to uh, Dr. General uh, Said Ghulain for giving me this opportunity. I'm really excited because the whole emerging field of health security is very novel, but still uh, is a moving target. COVID-19 is a virus that's really teaching us humbleness. This is essentially uh, uh, my analysis. No matter how developed a country is, no one is really ready to understand the full picture and the consequences of the pandemic will continue for decades. However, it is important to gain as much insights as possible from available data. So the strategy of this presentation is to try to recapitulate the situation in terms of the available data of the pandemic in the Middle uh, East and also how every uh, or representative governments really acted upon the pandemic and how they responded to the pandemic 
uh, it, it definitely it tells us a lot about the importance of the new emerging field of uh, uh, health security. So uh, essentially, uh, let's just go ahead and try to uh, go uh, forward uh, in this presentation. Uh, but I usually start with just outlining the content of my presentation. We will start by talking about the timeline and evolution of the pandemic. When did it start and how did it spread? And then we will talk about how the world now is becoming a small village and it's the small village effect, how the pandemic really quickly uh, uh, spread over to every single spot on this planet. The uh, impact of the pandemic on the MENA region, national securities are gonna be briefly discussed. And also I'm going to uh, present something about the effect of this on social security and also on individual securities, including job, financial, educational, and food insecurities. I'm hoping that I'm not gonna be able to cover every uh, single aspect of these, but we will try to be very brief and succinct to be able to cover all of these. And um, let us just uh, say that a sense of global Sisyphus, which is a, 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 a Greek mythology character, where every time he just pushes a huge stone over to the top of a mountain, uh, it falls back down and he will go back to uh, bring this stone. The, the world is really uh, in a state of uh, a global Sisyphus um, uh, fighting uh, uh, all over with economic crises and also climate changes. And all of a sudden, the, uh, the, uh, the COVID pandemic really uh, started to hit. So uh, the Middle East, of course, is one of the um, uh, uh, the most regions in the whole world that really are always passing through turmoil. And the MENA region is going through civil wars, a lot of uh, uh, raging civil wars in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and Libya. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people are killed every year. And so many of them are forced to leave their homes and, and, and flee outside their countries even and immigrate into uh, camps uh, with living standard that are really less than uh, uh, humane. Uh, uh, we have also between these uh, four conflicts, more than 20 million people have been displaced and approximately 35 million people are in daily need of hu humanitarian aid, according to the Pew Research Center. So the region is really in turmoil. And the result is that this region is usually described as an island of misery. And as you can see from all the news uh, coverage uh, of the area, plenty of uh, uh, damage, a lot of uh, uh, internal conflicts and civil wars, so many casualties, and uh, also so many people are displaced out of their homes. Not only that, but also the region is suffering from really existential problems, including the shortage and of water supplies, as you can see from this map. Uh, the light blue uh, regions are those with physical water scarcity. So people are really suffering already from uh, uh, lack of water and natural resources. And all of uh, a sudden, meanwhile, the COVID crisis had hit, uh, hit, yeah, uh, it, it had this, this region and this affected the lifestyle of everyone. Uh, we are not used to uh, sanitizing public uh, areas. We are not used to restricting our movement even to travel, we are not restrict, and also to restrict our movement to go to cafe shops or to sit socially with everyone else. And since the beginning of this crisis, national, social, economic, education, food insecurities has risen. And really, this is a really uh, a, a kind of you know public aware uh, awareness uh, campaign that was enforced and impacted our lifestyles. Uh, every one of us, not only countries in. Uh, in civil wars. Uh, to give you an example, uh, for example, the health system in Egypt is already overburdened. So this system is, um, just to, to tell you how, how burdened or overburdened this system is, look at, at this comparison between the number of hospital beds and the capacity of hospital beds. You can see that on the bottom uh, down there is Iraq where, with 1.3 beds per 1,000 uh, people. Egypt is actually uh, 1.5 per uh, uh, thousand uh, person. And this was a statistics at 2016. Of course, you cannot compare this with countries like Japan. Japan is really miles ahead of everybody, everybody else's in terms of the number 
of bed capacities uh, uh, in, in, in hospitals. To understand how uh, or how quickly the pandemic really spread over uh, through uh, the Middle East, uh, I just uh, prepared a couple of uh, slides and maybe infographics to show you, for example, the quick implications or quick application of uh, uh, government stringency index. And this stringency index is essentially a, a, a measure for uh, uh, how government applied things like school and public place closures, and also how quickly they, they applied also travel bans, etc. And it is uh, scaled from one or from, from zero to 100. And as you can see, the uh, spread of this tangency index, of course, started from China, the hurricane started in China. And you can see also that it's quickly covered, covered everywhere else. The, the, the measures are between uh, 880 and 100. And you can see that the Middle East was primarily affected uh, the earliest. And this is, of course, because the close proximity uh, of uh, the region with uh, Asia and China and so on. So uh, uh, the next thing that we uh, just should really have a look on on the timeline and evolution of this pandemic, let's just have a look on the cumulative confirmed COVID-19 cases in several representative countries in the region. Uh, you would be able to see or to compare uh, countries like Israel, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Iraq, Morocco, and Lebanon, and Jordan, and Palestine. And you can see in the beginning, this is during the early summer, uh, spring or the sp spring of last, last year, Egypt was uh, uh, ranked second after Saudi Arabia, but quickly Iraq has been catching up. And then Israel was uh, going or growing very quickly in terms of the number of uh, uh, reported cases. As you can see, Saudi Arabia was going down and Israel now by the uh, end of the year, last year, uh, some other countries are gaining momentum and rising quite quickly in terms of the number of reported cases, confirmed cases. Israel now is exceeding everyone else and Egypt is staying with Palestine down in the bottom of the list. And of course you may ask uh, whether this is really because of problems associated with lack of testing. So uh, in my next uh, infographics, I'm showing how testing has been considered, uh, but, but before that, we just will have a look on the number of uh, confirmed deaths uh, in, 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 in several of these same countries. And you can see in the beginning, Egypt has been reporting a high number of cases, although Egypt was reporting uh, uh, the lowest number of uh, uh, confirmed COVID-19 cases, but the number of deaths in Egypt was really high uh, up to summer of the, of the last year where Iraq was, was taking over and gradually many other stores started to really uh, rise. And as you can, you will see that by the beginning of this year, some countries really was jumping over to take over this trend. And you will see that Jordan and, uh, and, and Iraq were really uh, going, going quickly. Israel is now, uh, and Lebanon are surprisingly among uh, two countries that are in the middle range here. But you can see that Egypt is showing a uh, large number of uh, uh, mortality or deaths associated with COVID-19. Uh, 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 in fact, this is a little bit misleading because it's a tricky statistics because uh, in order for you to get some sort of accurate number, you have to normalize by the number of people, by, by the population of, uh, of individual countries. And here you will see something that's really interesting in terms of this uh, normalized, uh, normalized uh, statistics you will uh, uh, see that Israel is on the top of, uh, of this statistics because of course the number of people or the populations are low. You will see Egypt is maintaining a low profile in this case and then Iraq and Saudi Arabia were rising up. Uh, it's, uh, in, in last summer, Egypt was going down as you can see and Israel is going was rising quite quickly in terms of the normalized number of death and uh, continues Israel to be uh, on the top until Jordan. And you will see that also Lebanon and Palestine are going to rise up quite quickly uh, by the beginning of this year, where Lebanon now, there is a crisis of healthcare in, in, in Lebanon and the number of deaths has reached about 700 uh, person per uh, each million people. And look at this surprising number here. Egypt is in the bottom of this list, and this is definitely because the normalization is by the largest population in the region. So uh, uh, 
let's uh, see now and 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 also take uh, take some ideas on the testing policies because of course uh, uh, the testing policies controls the number of reported cases and look at this classification here you will see that uh, countries that are colored in dark red or maroon color they apply no testing policies uh, in brown these are countries that are applying measures to test people with symptoms and key groups only a selective uh, populations that, for example, VIP people and, and you know, people that are, uh, you know, uh, very, very capable in terms of their finance and power. Uh, again, also in the, uh, in the light, yellow, uh, light blue here, anyone with symptoms are tested and they, in the dark blue regions, you will see that open public testing is uh, inclusive, even with asymptomatic people that did, do, uh, you know, do not show any symptoms. And you can see that Egypt is surprisingly among uh, countries that applied fairly good uh, amount of testing in this, in this regard. So the impact, let's now move to talk about the impact of the pandemic on the uh, national security of the, of the countries. Definitely uh, uh, there are plenty of issues associated with countries that were already suffering from civil wars. For example, Syria, for instance, 3 million people are currently living in, a refugee, in refugee camps and reported its first uh, case of COVID-19 uh, uh, on July 9th, on 2020, last year. Uh, however, a little bit later, when people tested randomly one of the biggest refugee camps, which is Atama, the Atama uh, refugee camp, they discovered that at least 40% of people were positively tested for COVID-19. This is really, this was really shocking. Uh, and it tells you how much the pandemic is spread over in many, many places. In Yemen, of course, a worsening humanitarian crisis has been going on for several uh, years now and more than about, more than 80% of Yemen, Yemeni's population is dependent on humanitarian assistance for basic needs and services. Um, the country's healthcare system, of course, is similar to many, is even worse to sever to many other countries because of the uh, lengthy conflict and because of the lack of financial uh, resources. So Yemen, uh, Yemen's health sector is already overwhelmed by surge in COVID-19 death rates. And uh, a personal experience here is that I have had a postdoctor who were working with me. She is a Yemeni's uh, young doctor and she was working with me in Egypt but all of a sudden she heard that all of her families were infected by COVID-19 and she had to flee back, even though the trip back to Yemen was essentially very, very dangerous uh, because she was living in a, an area that's surrounding by the, by the Houthi uh, 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 group. So in, in Libya also, there have been uh, escalating conflicts, of course, which impedes COVID-19 responses. Uh, Libya's health system is also fragile after years of conflict and in and is consequently at high risk of being overwhelmed by COVID-19 crisis. These are all factors that are essentially affecting national securities. Up to 1 million people in Libya have been rendered dependent on humanitarian assistance as well. Uh, on the other hand, uh, during the pandemic, there have been a resurgence of terrorism. Uh, for example, there are reports that are that, I, that ISIS in one week, they're, uh, they're claimed uh, uh, operations uh, has risen by more than 70% only in one week. So this is really a, a challenging situation. Also, the stabilization efforts in many of the countries that I mentioned are really hampered by the uh, COVID-19 challenges and trying to uh, give care to uh, uh, people uh, in these countries. Uh, uh, let me also move to uh, show you the social impact. Let's see how uh, countries ha has applied the face covering, because face covering can be can indicate uh, the uh, social distancing measures, and this is of course a kind of things that have been uh, uh, really uh, reported uh, according to this infograph. You can see that early on last year, uh, the uh, enforcement of the uh, of the uh, uh, the uh, face covering started in the China and in the Middle East, where this is required at uh, all level. Uh, again, uh, this is, I think I, I, I moved uh, quickly to the next slide. Let me just go back, sorry, sorry about this. So in, in, for, for, uh, for face covering, what happened is that essentially it started in China and then spread over to some countries in Europe, as you can see. And then 
by uh, uh, spring last year, it started to cover most of the uh, global sphere. And as you can see, Egypt was among the earliest places to apply these measures and then to maintain these measures where uh, it is required in, in public spaces. Later on, these measures became uh, more stringent in, in this region, including required outside home at all times and required in all public spaces. Let's go for the next measure uh, also is the impact on education. Uh, here is the infographics that's showing the spread of uh, school closures in the whole uh, world. And you can see in, in brown, this is required. Uh, as you can see, that is uh, happening or happening all over the, the globe, in fact, and it is maintained and preserved uh, over these regions. In, in fact, there are some problems associated with the uh, uh, public education in Egypt, uh, because it's forced, it's, it, must, it's, it can be the biggest source of infections. And also, there have been some glitches and problems associated with the foreign education in Egypt, like the American school system and the British school system, where a lot of confusion happened because of the pandemic in the or in the, in the uh, original countries of these schools. Uh, so there have been a lot of confusion, a lot, a lot of students were uh, taking tests from home. Uh, let's uh, also have a look on how government were really uh, providing some aid to, uh, uh, to uh, their citizens. And here in this scale, uh, the brown color, there is no income support. The light blue is less than 50% of the lost salaries and uh, more than 50% more than are expressed in countries in blue. You can see how this evolved over the past uh, uh, one year and a half. And you can see in the beginning, nobody uh, offered some assistance. And of course, it started over in Scandinavian countries and of course, North American countries and rich Gulf countries. Uh, surprisingly, uh, some uh, Egypt started and many other Arab countries started to provide this subsidies and, and uh, support to people that lost their jobs. And this continues uh, uh, until, uh, until today. Uh, they are uh, providing less than 50% of the lost salary. But of course, this has been alleviated or left over in most of the African countries and India and many uh, Asian countries uh, and South American countries. But Egypt and Sudan, surprisingly, are still uh, maintaining this uh, government support. So uh, food insecurity, because of course, the um, closure that happened over uh, borders, international borders, uh, many countries in the Middle East have, were already vulnerable to food insecurity and economic shocks before the events of 2020. A lockdown measures took effect, incomes and employment fell drastically. People were not able to, in many, many places, were not able to fulfill the needs of, the, of their families. Uh, uh, luckily, Egypt didn't suffer from this issue. And in fact, I think if we made uh, some sort of measures uh, over this past year, we will uh, notice an, a noticeable increase in people's weight because people were staying at home and eating a lot. This is, <laughs> this is one of the things that probably should be uh, investigated later on. But of course, this, this, uh, th there have been a, a really diverse uh, uh, impact uh, of this lack of food in, in, in the region. Let me also uh, just uh, uh, give you an idea on the uh, uh, vaccination trends in the region. As you can see, of course, Israel since the beginning are essentially uh, on top and not only on, uh, in the region, but also uh, globally. Israel is the top country or the most important country that has already administered uh, uh, vaccination to more than 80% of its population. Uh, however, I think also there are some politics that are associated with vaccination. So let me just give you an, uh, some examples. For example, uh, vaccination is not administered equally uh, in Syria, for instance, uh, because of the conflict and local conflict. There have been a lot of reports reporting that the government in Syria is only administering uh, vaccination to uh, their group, the governing uh, group, uh, while ignoring uh, places where there are some conflicts and, uh, and uh, insurgencies. Uh, Palestinians are not vaccinated, and this is really surprising because Israel, as we mentioned, have already uh, uh, vaccinated more than 80% of its population. And uh, although they were sending vaccinations to settlements, Israeli settlements in the West Bank, uh, there haven't been uh, uh, any uh, vaccination efforts to Palestinians as I write, as I was uh, uh, searching for this information. In Yemen, healthy uh, religious, religious leaders have told locals not to use vaccines made by Jews and Christians. This is really 
ridiculous. And at one stage, the healthy health administrator said, uh, or the health minister said, even that they will develop their own COVID-19 vaccination. This is really uh, ironic and, and bizarre. So um, let's just uh, look at what we learn from this kind of uh, you know, information coverage that we have went through. COVID-19 pandemic is the most striking example of a global crisis in modern history. It has transformed the concept of global health security because now countries has to foresee what's going to happen in terms of the spread of pandemic or similar pandemics. We, the international community need to glean new multilateral approaches towards respective mechanisms and responsive mechanisms to crises similar to the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 pandemic resembles a massive conflict because it disrupts access to food, wages, and medical care. So one should really think of the pandemic as a kind of local conflict that may be transferring into a kind of global uh, uh, conflict. Effects of COVID-19 may endure well beyond the current initial phases of the crisis. We know, we really don't know how long the, this, this is gonna impact the international, uh, uh, international economies. And of course, there have been a, a blessing for several places in several countries because uh, for example, the medical suppliers and also vaccination countries that really manufacturing uh, vaccinations, this is for them is a huge opportunity. Whereas for poor countries, this is really, really a big crisis. Uh, again, stabilization efforts will be critical to assess with COVID-19 response over the coming months and also to ensure long-term peace and stability in the region. Many countries, including Japan and other countries would really uh, need to understand that stabilization and trying to handle shortage of medical supplies or their frontline protection against uh, uh, second and third waves of the, uh, the pandemic. Healthcare and contributions to the well-being of individuals and societies must be recognized because we are living in a small world and every one of us is really affected by what's happening uh, not only in the neighboring country but also in very, very far countries as we are now all have witnessed. Uh, I'm ending by an um, African proverb uh, who said, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. And I really thank you for your uh, attention and I'm be very happy to respond to any question be, that you may have. Thank you very much, Sameh, for, for your very comprehensive um, assessment of the COVID-19 impact in, on the region and also in the in Egypt, um, I if um, audience, uh, I'm asking um, all to audience, uh, if we have any specific questions to Dr. Samah's presentation on COVID-19, would you raise your hand? Raise your blue hand, electronic hand. And um, before taking questions, I might be you know the first to. Uh, some uh, pose a small uh, question and um, I, I, I want to know about uh, the situation in Egyptian healthcare system you know uh, even before before the COVID-19 crisis um, the, the, the s s situation in, in Egyptian medical and healthcare system is known for the stretch you know uh, for, for the uh, stress. It, it, it's it's been under heavy pressure of uh, overpopulation and uh, uh, scarce resources. Uh, of course, you, you know your hospital is yeah, exceptionally equipped with, but the uh, um, huge population in Egypt, in Egypt doesn't have enough, you know, uh, access to the, the advanced uh, and universal. Our, our healthcare system. Uh, so, how you know the situation has been influenced by the COVID nineteen arrival of a new and huge global crisis? Uh, so, from your standpoint, uh, what's the the you know, direct impact in the, uh, of COVID nineteen right now, and how do you foresee how Egypt will navigate this difficult? You know, uh, a phase. Well, um, 
This is very important question indeed. Um, let me just say that uh, not only Egypt has suffered a lot everywhere, even uh, very advanced countries have been faced with a huge challenge to uh, cope with the needs for emergency uh, medicine and taking care of a huge number of people. The problem also is that with a lot of unknowns, uh, so many people rush to hospitals to try to get some cares. And of course, this would occupy many of the already limited number of beds, as I explained. And this really caused a huge overburdening of the healthcare system. Egypt uh, definitely has, has suffered from uh, accelerating increase in the number of populations and while not coping with the, these increasing number of populations with uh, parallel uh, healthcare facilities is in fact. So, um, however, um, I, I should say that this, this has been the situation for several decades and this of course uh, really uh, left the situation quite dire uh, uh, and and uh, even though the current uh, uh, regime and government has been really applying, really uh, trying to improve the healthcare system, and there have been huge efforts that are really applauded by the international communities, including the uh, uh, action against uh, virus C, uh, which was a huge pandemic in Egypt with uh, the, the minimum estimate of the number of people with uh, with uh, hepatitis C was about 10 millions, which is really, really a huge burden for any country. But uh, Egypt has led a campaign to eradicate virus C and it was quite successful. It was really very, very good uh, 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 campaign. Again, also Egypt uh, initiated uh, what's so-called 100 million health it's meet million saha in Arabic, uh, 100, 100 million health uh, initiative. And this has been really a, an exemplary system where now uh, we are the leading country in, in the whole world in terms of the knowledge about the number of chronic disease patients in the country. So there is now a database where you, we know exactly who had diabetes, hypertension, and so on. And these are extremely important uh, efforts that has been administered to the society to improve the general public health and to acquire knowledge that are really critical to know how to move forward. And of course, uh, Egypt also has been really aware of the changes that's happening in modern medicine. For example, there is a genome, uh, the, 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 the first Egyptian uh, reference genome project has been uh, announced very, very recently, probably last week, actually, it got approval from the president, from President Sisi, and this uh, uh, is spending more than 2 billion Egyptian uh, uh, pounds, which is probably closer to about 150 million uh, US dollars. Uh, uh, and this is uh, to determine the first, this is the first project to determine the Egyptian reference genome. Uh, and this is very, very helpful in terms of the health uh, uh, implications. So, however, on the ground, public health systems are really deficient and they do not have sufficient number of beds. Even the uh, care, the urgent care and emergency cares were, care were really, really uh, limited uh, when the pandemic hit. Um, I would say that my assessment is that the uh, public health, public health uh, officials learned it quite quickly and they actually improved the infrastructure quickly. And the military in Egypt has established a lot of hospitals so many hospitals with large number of beds, and this essentially helped to uh, siege and contain the, uh, the pandemic, in fact, in Egypt. And uh, my assessment is that the performance of the Egyptian government during this crisis has been excellent, in fact. And, and this is a professional assessment of what really uh, was going on uh, on the ground. Thank you very much. You know, the, the the combination of digital economy and new public health system would be a key for Egypt or any country to overcome the, the, this, you know, uh, uh, crisis. And uh, um, I, I, I think Egyptian case and its response and the, its relatively mild, you know, condition right now would be a uh, very, you know, very uh, important case uh, for study. So we will check it uh, further on in the 
near future. So uh, thank you very much for your uh, inf inform you, the information you gave to us. And uh, uh, also some question is coming in to uh, one question from um, um, Ibrahim. Uh, it's about vaccine passport. Um, so fr from Egyptian point of view, uh, what kind of you know standardization or a passport system for the the international movement of people? Uh, what what's the Egyptian you know policy or diplomacy on, on this issue? You know there are different possibilities like um, international organization like WHO would take lead or in regionally uh, regionally for example. Uh, some Gulf countries would need the uh, quick re renewal or a quick re resumption of uh, the movement of people, uh, at least in in the region. For you know, for they are so dependent on this, uh, um, you know, people who who work across the borders. So, uh, for, there are many possibilities, but from Egyptian point of view, what kind of system would be, you know, required or needed? Um, it, again, this these are this is an, an interesting question. Um, of course, this is a, a, a quite a new uh, situation that everyone on this planet is suffering from. And definitely we are learning uh, uh, along the way and um, everyone is trying to learn and to adapt. However, countries that are not producing their own vaccination are in a bad situation because you are not on the top of the list. Definitely you are not getting what you really need and what your population need uh, quickly. And, and this is a situation that Egypt has been suffering from. And definitely here politics and economy are playing very important role. What this is one one point. The other point is that the public awareness of the meaning of vaccination and the conspiracy theory that has been spreading over uh, in the whole globe. It's not only in Egypt. It's actually everywhere else. It, even in in Europe and in the United States, a lot of people have declined to take the vaccine because they believe that they are gonna implant like a microchip in their in their arm and they are gonna be able to follow them uh, everywhere and so on. Uh, again, also some other people, they believe that this is, we are, they, they are testing uh, vaccines on, 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 on our poor people and so on. And this has even been uh, a popular conspiracy theory, even among professional people and surprisingly among physicians, some, uh, I would say that maybe 30 to 40 percent of all physicians has declined to take vaccination because of this, these fears and these conspiracy theories. Uh, definitely, uh, the cybersecurity uh, aspects that Dr. El Gindi has been talking with us about, and also the media, they are they should be playing a very important role in this to inform people how. Uh, they really uh, search for the truth, how they really think rationally about the importance of vaccination and how to see that without vaccination, we would have been suffering from so many diseases. And of course, to be able to contain this and to be able to alleviate the economical implications of what's happening, you need to siege and you need to contain this pandemic. And there is no way that you'll be able to, to contain it without vaccination. So. Uh, this is an opportunity for everyone to work together. And I think it's a perfect cluster here because now we have all aspects in one place. And I think, I think the government has been trying uh, to do this and they have made a system where everyone, every citizen should register using their national security number to take uh, her, his or her uh, turn in getting the vaccine. Uh, and this is uh, now, um, of course, it's, the efforts has been very slow because, as I'm saying, uh, not so so many, uh, not so much of the vaccine has been flowing into the country because we are not on the top of the list of the uh, manufacturers. Uh, there have been some efforts in Egypt. I'm hearing that they, there have been some efforts to manufacture a local vaccination, but there haven't been much uh, uh, information about it, and we are uh, on the wait. Yeah, one of the, you know, of course, long time 
uh, focal point for, for industrial policy in Egypt is, you know, it's pharmaceutical industry and pharmaceutical sector. But uh, um, yeah, unfortunately, we, we don't hear, you know, much from Egypt uh, about its in, uh, autonomous, um, you know, um, production. Uh, if there are some in news, uh, I, I'd like to hear from you, but uh, from anyone, but um, so um, now we want to um, uh, open to the floor our discussion, but maybe before that, uh, I'd ask Dr. Said Ghonem, uh, Said, uh, you know, we, we, now, we now, you know, discuss about uh, all three topics um, by, by three presenters, uh, and actually we, we already know, you know, it, it, their topics are interconnected. So, but, uh, so do, do you give us some of your comments uh, on the entire topics after the three presentations? Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's just what I can I say, but uh, we could see right now that threats are very connected. And these two new threats, I can say, new doesn't mean it's now, but I mean for what will know what the common threats, which is cybersecurity and health, public health. They really prove that they are affecting all other elements. And media here is the main player sometimes or in similar you know, incidents it happened. So that's why really I would like to more recom recommend and say, we have to keep that in the consideration. And we have to give big and very high priority to these three elements, which we talk today. <clears throat> Whatever, if, you, if any country or any responsible would like to give them, uh, to make them, as I mentioned, as a main element of national security, or take them as a true project with true strategy to how to overcome not only the current challenge, but also the expected challenge within this frame, which we talked about. Uh, finally, if I can summarize, I would like to say something a little bit, uh, it's related, but separate from my professional uh, comment. Really, I thank you so much, Professor Sertishi. It's regular that we end up or we finish with thank you. It's, I'm not finishing for sure because we will have some more questions. But I would like to say something here which is really important. You succeeded. You have, I know that you don't like praising. I know that, but I'm not praising. I'm saying facts. You succeeded to do something that to put really the national security in front of the Japanese specialists, I'm sorry, to, to, to make Middle East in front of the Japanese specialists, how to see what's going on in a very professional and how can I say, true shape. And it was very good opportunity to have three Egyptians from different generations. I'm the youngest one, the fourth one, so, and really, I think it's, it's very protective to, to all of us. And I hope that we continue more and I keep in my mind to increase Egyptians and Arabia more and more next time. So we, you can proceed with your question now. Thank you very much for your kind comment. And uh, of course, I always wanted to have more, you know, Egyptian presentation representation presentation in our you know seminars and uh, I, I know it's uh, Egypt has a resource of, of a huge you know middle class professionals and uh, uh, so um, this is only first opportunity and uh, we'll expect next and so thank you for your cooperation help all as well with and um, still we have time some time for, for discussion and uh, maybe I, I Pose, you know, recently, recent. Oh, um, um, yes. So there are some uh, comments uh, coming in uh, to in the chat box. But um, um, so um, one question from Japan, as always, you know, 
uh, it, it, nowadays, uh, uh, all in Japan, you know, it, it, it's a society we are looking at each other. So we always ask about China, you know, how China is doing in your country. <laughs> so um, for, for, exa for example, um, Dr. Same, um, there are re reports in international media, there are competition of, you know, vaccine diplomacy, vaccine geopolitics, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I think Egypt one is one of the destination of, of this international, you know, uh, um, you know competition, uh, rivalry. Uh, how do you see, you know, on, on the vaccine issue, uh, how China is doing, or, or other countries like Russia, uh, who compete with, with the United States and Europe in the international states. Uh, uh, from Egyptian point of view, or uh, how you, know, you are uh, 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 tackling with or you are faced with the, this international competition. Oh, oh would you amend? Um, okay, okay. Uh, I think the, uh, the selection of uh, vaccines uh, is um, not only a purely scientific or a medical decision anymore. There have been a lot or plenty of uh, political aspects and economical aspects that are interfering with the selection and the choice of a vaccination. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, as a professional, I have a lot of issues with uh, both uh, Chinese and also Russian vaccinations because or due to the lack of supporting evidence, scientific publications that are reputable and respectable, where me as a, a health science professional and researcher, I can consult to know exactly whether this vaccination is going to be effective or not, whether it is really made up to the standards of uh, safety and also efficacy of uh, such kind of vaccination. And this has been always a problem with Chinese products, and, and let us just put it that way. However, uh, because of economic issues and implications and also political uh, influence, the, you don't have much choices, in fact. So if uh, we can get all uh, vaccination made by Pfizer or by other uh, huge companies, then we wouldn't resort to uh, the Chinese or the Russian uh, vaccinations. So uh, this is the assessment is that uh, in the beginning, the Egyptian government decided to go with the Chinese vaccination. And later on, uh, there appeared some sort of problems. Uh, let's put it that way, uh, without disclosing what kind of problems happened, because this is a research uh, subject and we don't, we don't want to rush into conclusions. However, so that, that essentially led the government to switch to different types of, uh, of vaccination, especially that uh, our uh, group in, in, in uh, 57, 357 hospital uh, discovered that the uh, strain of virus that's uh, hitting Egypt is very similar to European and especially Italian uh, 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 source. And this uh, led the government to switch the, uh, the origin of the vaccines to uh, something that's originated in Europe or in the United States to tackle uh, the Caucasian populations and so on. So uh, briefly, uh, I think uh, for any country to, uh, to spread their product, there has to be a supporting evidence that this is really safe and, effic and effective uh, before uh, trying to sell it to everyone. Uh, science now is, is capable of telling us whether there will be a long-term effect or not, whether this uh, vaccination is going to be effective or not, and so on. Uh, having said that, uh, no single vaccine is currently uh, known to be perfect because this is essentially, is very hard to develop vaccines in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, it, it's a, an epidemiologic fact that it is very hard to develop a vaccine while you have so much, so many of the population is already infected. This is a, a very, very, it's like you are swimming upstream. So uh, I don't think that any of the, uh, uh, the uh, publicized vaccinations uh, is really perfect right now. And I think we have to wait and see what's going on and how this is gonna turn into uh, and keep our eye open on the uh, uh, scientific publications.
So uh, uh, I don't know whether I, I, I was able to address your question, but of course there are many, many elements to the decision, including economic and also political elements. Thank you very much for, for, for your very informative and responsible uh, uh, answer uh, from, a, from a professional working on, on, on very responsibly on, on this issue. So um, thank you very much. Re I really appreciate it. And, uh, and there's another question uh, or comment in the chat box from Muhammad al karyubi and about um, the impact of uh, social media. Uh, and uh, um, so social media or the network, social networking me media is an S. And um, well, fortunately, we have two media uh, uh, experts. Uh, one um, is kind of old media, even though it, it, it's uh, um, advanced, you know, Ahmed from TV. And also, um, Muhammad, um, of course, you are more, you know, uh, acquainted with, with, with what's going on in the SNS in, in, in Egypt, particularly in Egypt. And uh, so first, um, uh, maybe Muhammad, uh, I, I would ask Muhammad, how do you see the, the recent uh, social network, you know, world? Uh, what's what's the re recent development in, in Egypt? Uh, I think this is very 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 interesting, you know, uh, issue, and, and it's very advanced. And we we never see if we we are away from e e Egypt for um, you know a couple of months, we we cannot catch up. So uh, would you you know share with us some your comment, your some your understanding right now? Um, related to the social media in Egypt, uh, you, yeah, you know, social media in Egypt uh, is, um, you know, ha has also uh, its own characteristics. <laughs> so if we are uh, now focusing on uh, things that are, uh, you know, um, uh, from my point of view, the traditional media is getting information from social media to create some kind of maybe stories or trends in the traditional media in the traditional media in order to 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 grab the attention of people who are still watching the traditional media and from my point of view this is very dangerous because um traditional media uh, you know has its its own rules its own you know um uh, code of conduct and uh, code of ethics and you have all the rules that govern the traditional media and it's established and even you can, you know, manage to to deal with these things in the traditional media. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, it's different uh, when it, when we are talking about social media. So anyone can post anything on social media, whether it's fake or true. You don't understand how this information is flowing through the social media, who is influencing the the social media sphere in a, in a specific country like Egypt, for example, who is creating a chaos chaos on the social media, who is taking the trend. To you know, to manipulate the traditional media, and and I think this is very dangerous because uh, it, it's not easy to depend on the information that's posted on social media to be the, the reference and the, the source to to transfer it automatically to the traditional media. I see this is one of the biggest issues in in, in Egypt. Maybe I, I I would like to say that Egypt is the focus now. So uh, we need to 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 put some kind of guidelines for the traditional media to deal with social media because not everything that's posted on social media is suitable to to be transferred automatically to the traditional media because the the influence of the traditional media um, is very very you know um, effective in, in terms of generations who are uh, you know um, getting the, the the source of the information from the traditional media so and uh, maybe the the public opinion is also manipulated easily with with the traditional media because you can easily create um, some kind of chaos and some kind of um, public um, you know opinion cases that can that can change uh, the the decisions of a policymaker uh, using traditional media from something that's not true or that's not um, maybe suitable to be appear on the traditional media. And we have witnessing 
a lot of cases like this in the in the Egyptian uh, uh, media sphere. Thank you very much. And Ahmed, I want to um, ask um, Ahmed to you know how, the the comment. You know how, how this you know you are in the media business, a media sector, and but uh, as uh, as Muhammad pointed out, nowadays the relationship between uh, old or established media and the new media or social media is changing. And in a way, social media has um, upper hand in a way. So how, how do you cope with this situation? I, I just want to have, you know, how you are living your, you know, work nowadays. Uh, now you, every citizen is a journalist, is a reporter. Every citizen has his own mobile. He can record an accident. He can uh, take a photograph for this accident. He can document anything he sees in his daily life. This is journalism. But the traditional media is now filtering the social media and plays the, the role of the professional gate that filters and the professionalize the content. You cannot uh, differentiate between both of them. Uh, two decades ago or one decade ago, you had the user and the producer, the producer of content or news or uh, programs, daily programs, and the user on the other uh, side. Today, you have the broad users. Both of them uh, are playing the same role. But me in the tradition, uh, uh, people who are working in traditional media are more professionalized and have the sensitive uh, tool to differentiate between what is fake and what is uh, uh, ethical and not ethical. And ha they have uh, the tools to examine the content, the accidents, uh, the different uh, sides of the story. Uh, social media introduces a, a, a massive content daily to the media while the media is taking, the traditional media, taking two steps back. I think in the future, there will be uh, a certain contract, not treating contract between uh, the both sides to, uh, to set the scene uh, in a credible way, the credibility which the traditional media have because uh, the responsibility uh, the social responsi responsibility, uh, this social respons responsibility will make media, traditional media, have rigid measurements and rigid uh, tools to filter what to take from the social media and what not. And the social media users, uh, after two or three years, in my opinion, uh, will dig out and will know the, the law of the game. Don't produce a content which is not ethical or have uh, or contain mistakes or uh, misleading, a misleading content because the traditional media will examine it more professionally than the, the moment and will ignore or even will, uh, will say in the public, this is wrong, this is misleading, and this is uh, managed or controlled by this part or this uh, political player or this party or uh, this country or whoever. Thank you very much. It's, uh, you are living in, in fluidity uh, as your presentation showed us and, uh, and how uh, now your comments showed us how Egyptian profession, professionals are adapting itself to the new situation. And uh, okay, thank you very much for you. your participation and presentation and discussions. And uh, we all are very, very enriched by uh, your, you know, energy, your insight. And so uh, we, we, we will continue on, but uh, now, now time is up. And so, uh, thank you very much for today's pre presentations and participation.
And with, with this, we conclude our joint um, seminar series uh, of geopolitical dynamism in the wider Middle East region. Um, as always, I, I appreciate Dr. Said Ghanem's um, effort to make it, it possible and also uh, dear presenters uh, for generously uh, sharing with us your, your expertise. And of course, our audiences, um, every time, each time uh, our audience uh, were very, very patiently, you know, attended our discussions and uh, they uh, are, you know, we, uh, they are uh, part of our community right now. So we will continue uh, on this framework and develop it. So um, the, 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 this uh, seminar would be the last of this fiscal year, but in the renewed uh, fiscal year, we all, again, we, we will find new framework or, or continuation of, of the, the, this uh, dialogues and uh, discussions. So um, please, um, uh, um, uh, we will uh, ha, uh, keep uh, um, uh, our uh, you know discussions. So please follow us, and we'll be in touch with you in the next occasion. Uh, thank you very much for today's participation. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, one, 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 one topic. One, one talk. So, Thank you. Uh, uh, Said, Said, you are muted. Yeah. So only yeah. When, when, before we hear. Thank you very much again. Uh, I would like to mention something uh, to everybody. Mm -hmm. Professor Satoshi has during our conversation uh, the stick thing from Messenger. Yeah. yeah. yeah he, he talked to me mm. about the main strengths mm. of the Egyptian people. Mm. And he talked especially about the middle class. Mm. And here we are four from the middle class regions. This is like a sample of the Egyptian middle class. Yeah. And he mentioned something that middle class is very thick. That means maybe a number, mm. but also I think thick of, variety, of various quality as yeah. he mentioned also. So middle class in Egypt, we have from very below coming from, you know, like technicians and so, I mean, below, I mean, in, in level of mm -hmm. uh, education and up to, even, you know, experts, mm -hmm. scientists and so. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I hear somebody is talking mm -hmm. to the Egyptian people, not to the government. And as we are aware that the state is composed of three, which is uh, the government, the land, and the people. And the main component is the people component. Right. So that was really a direct talk to the Egyptian people and it has been accepted very tremendously. I mean, I can say very generously, we like that. Today in the morning, I have received also uh, if you allow me, Professor Toshi, to mention from Mr. Makoto Ohashi, mm -hmm. something very new also for me, because what Satoshi said to do was really new for me, and maybe several people, that's why you, something like you press the button, where is the strength of the Egyptian, which really we need to know, or at least some of us know, but we need to confirm how you understand us. It's first time to know how you understand us mm -hmm. as people. Remember, and Mr. Makoto Ahashi talked to me about another dimension, but in the same way, somehow. Demographically, three big powers in our region, which is Iran, Turkey, and Egypt. And these three countries, they are also common in culture, in history. Each one of the three has its own, in, own language. Persian language, Turkish language, Egyptian, Arabian language, I'm sorry, Arabian language. The good advantage of Egypt, that is the only big power of population. And as you mentioned, if I add your important statement with a very thick middle class, 
compared with other rich Arabian countries who don't have this, even they are more influential and richer. And compared with that, so, but Egyptian still the thickest one. I don't talk about who is better, who is less, but I'm talking about the truth on the fact on the ground right now. If I connect that with Mr. Makutu Ahashi, what he said, that that's why Egypt is very important to all Arabian countries to be stable and strong because of this feature, which is population with thick middle class, as you mentioned. And that's why Egypt should be always in the leadership needed by all Arab countries to be supported you know, by Egypt. And he gave me a very nice example when he said that something like, let me say it in my own way, the exemplar example is Saudi Arabia, which always needs Egypt strong and stable because it's needed, because it's one of the lonely three, very big population country with history, language, although that we have the same religion. I promise that inshallah with the coming times, I will keep with more Egyptians, as I mentioned, different views, new ideas, how to connect, because really you are helping. You are really helping because I think we need to think more about the middle class, how to return it back very strong and the same thickness, which we should always keep in Egypt also. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. This would um, really help us to see the trend, you know, new trend coming in. And so uh, in the ne next fiscal year, we'll do go forward together so, uh, uh, on, on this new topic. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, with this, we conclude today's event. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye.